Chapter 3 April 25th, 1941 through October 5th, 1942 Kopolini Farm, Poland I didn't make it as far as my grandmother's. For the first three days after leaving Krakow, I wondered if I'd make it anywhere at all. Papa had warned me to be careful about who I trusted, so I trusted no one. I stole eggs from untended chicken coops, hid whenever a car or wagon passed by, and slept in cold ditches at night covered with reeds and grasses, wondering how long I could last this way. Not long. I'd known that since the moment I left Krakow. Then on the third day, I wandered past a sign for the village of Kapolini, and a memory sparked within me. A farm there was run by a couple named Shimshon and Gusta Drenjen, Drenger, both in their early twenties. Before the war, they had been the leaders of my Jewish scout group, Akiva, which taught us about our culture and history and who we might become one day. I'd lost track of them after the invasion, though I had heard Shimshan was arrested for a while for some of his anti-Nazi writings. Late that night, I showed up on the Drenger's doorstep, tears already rolling down my cheeks. I hadn't seen them for two years. What if they didn't remember me? What if they did and couldn't take me? By the time Gusta answered the door, I was almost shaking with worry. She was a pretty woman with a serious nature and a warmth that immediately began to calm me. Chai Lindner? She said, clearly surprised. I took a deep breath, hoping that what I had to ask wasn't too much. I knew it was. The last thing anyone needed these days was another mouth to feed. Will you let me stay the night? I can leave by morning if... Nonsense, Gusta wrapped my her, an arm around my shoulder and led me inside. Of course she'll stay here for as long as you want. If there was a way to love her more in that moment, I didn't know it. I did stay. And it wasn't only me. One by one that first summer, other Akiva scouts came to the farm. All of us suddenly on our own but slowly becoming family. We worked the farm during the day and gathered each evening to socialize and study. It was a good life until we thought of those we had left behind, of our true families, most of whom were now trapped inside the ghetto during what turned out to be a very cold winter, locked behind walls with too little food and too much disease. The problem worsened with every new wave of Jews brought in from other areas of Poland. Then selections were made and hundreds disappeared by train or were simply shot down in the street. So far my family was not among them, but I saw other Akiva members crying and prayed that I would never have to fully understand how they felt. Most of the news about the ghettos came to us from another Akiva leader, a man a little older than the Drangers, who everyone called Dolek. I'd heard it was a fake name, but I never asked him about it. If he was hiding his true identity, there had to be a reason. Where both the Drangers looked distinctly Jewish, Dolek had more Polish features. Thanks to Shimshan's forgeries, he was able to travel nearly anywhere in the country and return as often as possible, telling us of a war that seemed to be spreading all over the world, of Jewish resistance groups forming up in Warsaw, or worst of all, what happened to those who were taken away by train which meant I was already anxious on the day he arrived from Krakow 
and motioned me over beside him on a bench at the back of the house. It was early in the summer of 1942, and I'd hoped the warmer weather would bring better days ahead. How wrong I was. Dolik had just come from the Podgors ghetto where my family lived. No. No, it couldn't be that. Surely there was another reason why his mouth looked grim, his eyes so heavy, why the tone of his voice was flat when he said, I have some terrible news for you. My heart constricted enough that I could barely mumble. Please don't say it. He paused too long, and if he was struggling to as if he was struggling to force the words out, then it was even harder to make himself sit there, sit here, when what I really wanted to do was run somewhere, anywhere, and to keep running until the war couldn't touch me any more, where it couldn't hurt me or those I loved. For that was impossible. Finally, he said, It's about your brother and sister. I'm so sorry. I stopped breathing, and the corners of my vision blurred. This wasn't happening. Not this. He continued. Sarah was taken away on a train to Balzac. Dolek's tone was gentle, but his words struck me like a blow to the chest. I thought you should know. What is Belzec? A labor camp? At first he didn't answer. He only furrowed his brow, his somber expression full of compassion. I've told you what I've seen there, Chaya. You already know what it is. A death camp. Sarah was barely eight years old. She knew nothing of war or violence. She'd fall victim to a level of hatred she couldn't begin to comprehend. Enormous tears spilled onto my cheeks, which I was certain would never dry. But he wasn't finished. I squeaked out, my brother. The same night as your sister was taken, your brother failed to return home. Zitzchak was twelve at the time. He loved to build things with his hands, but my father had ho hoped he had, would join him in his shoe repair business instead. Like my mother, he used to sing. Used to. Maybe he was still alive. Maybe not. We might never know for sure. On the day my little sister was sent to her death, I had been planting seeds in the ground congratulating myself on having escaped the worst effects of the war. That evening, when Yitz disappeared, I'd been laughing with my friends here, planning the feast we might have when the harvest came in. I was utterly ashamed of myself and vowed in that very moment to find a way to remember them, to honor them, a way to bring, home, bring, a way to bring some meaning to their loss. If I could, I just didn't know how to do it. My answer came later that same night as we gathered around the supper table. Dolek reported on what he had, what he had seen and heard around Poland about the mass graves of Jews shot dead in the forests. Our people packed so tightly onto the train that many never survived the trip to the so-called labor camps. And if they did survive, they were likely killed upon arrival anyway. We know the truth, he said, but most of the Jews do not. They refuse to believe it or can't comprehend such horrors. His eyes flicked to me, even when it touches their own lives. Then Dolek told the others about my family. There were tears and expressions of sympathy, but I was hardly the first to receive such news. Only the latest in a long line of Akiva members who were mourning friends and family still trapped in the ghettos. Or not in the ghettos. Not any longer. Shimshon stood 
our situation has become clear. It is time for Akiva to make a choice. Do we remain a scout group, pretending the war isn't happening, happening to us and never will? Or do we become something more? Let us decide our fate before it is decided for us. Standing beside him, Gusta said, Let's be clear. Any decision we make will end with our deaths. If we do nothing, if we wait here, it's only a matter of time before the Germans come for us and put us on the same trains. Dolik leaned forward to add, Or there is a second option. What if we die on our feet, fighting back? He grinned. What if we prove to the Nazis, prove to the world, that not all Jews will be like lambs to the slaughter? Shimshim clapped a hand on his father's shoulder, on his friend's shoulder. We will join other resistance groups. We will disrupt the Germans when we can. Above all, in every way possible, we will try to save the lives of our people, if you all agree. As I lifted my eyes to, to him, I was flooded with competing emotions, fear and doubt swirling with my sadness and guilt, blending strangely into something I could only describe as excitement. I didn't understand why I should feel such eager anticipation. None of us had military experience, or for that matter, life experience. We had no money, no connections, and no training. Our Akiva leaders weren't pretending we had any chance to succeed. But if we did nothing, if we continued living behind this sheer veil of safety, then we would certainly fail. More importantly, I owed something to Yit Yitzchak and Sarah, and to my parents, who might eventually be forced into the death camps too. I wanted revenge for every single Jew who had already fallen and a chance to save the life of every Jew still standing. I was one of the first to raise my hands and say, I'm in. Other hands followed, both boys and girls, the youngest of us teens and our leaders not much older. I didn't know how someone like me could possibly make a difference. But if this was my way to honor Yitzhak and Sarah, then I would do so, do whatever my leader asked me. Their request came that same night. After everyone had left for bed, Gusta pulled me aside. Have you heard of the couriers, Chaya? When I shrugged, she added, the courier's primary job is to get in and out of the ghettos. To get in, you have to forget everything that makes you Jewish. She pursed her lips. I've noticed your accent is less Jewish than the rest of ours. We lived in a Polish district before, I said. My parents sent me to the public schools with the Poles. She smiled, obviously pleased. Were you often mistaken for being Polish? More than I was thought to be Jewish, in contrast to many Jews, my hair was blonde, my complexion a little lighter. I spoke Polish as fluently as I did Yiddish, the language of most Jews in Poland, and I even spoke a little German. Gusta's face became grim when she said, I won't lie to you, Shia. This is a very dangerous job. As a courier, you will smuggle in food or money, maybe forged identification papers or items of greater risk. At all times, you will have information about the resistance. If you are caught, you will be shot on sight. More likely, you will be tortured first. My eyes widened. Tortured? She didn't hesitate. The invaders will do whatever they can do to extract the information they want. If they don't succeed with you, they will threaten your loved ones or fellow prisoners. They might kill them right in front of you, but under no circumstance can you ever tell them what you know. Not one word, Chaya, or everything we are doing here is lost. I could pretend that her words didn't frighten me, and she saw my hesitation quickly added. 